Good morning. My name is Chuck Moratz. I am the Senior Vice President of Engineering and Manufacturing at Clark Material Handling Company here in Lexington, Kentucky. As this year's Chair of National Forklift Safety Day, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. This is the seventh annual National Forklift Safety Day. The first six events featured meetings in our nation's capital. While today's event is being held as a virtual meeting, that in no way diminishes its importance. I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to watch and listen to this video during this important event, especially during these trying times we're facing today, not only as a nation, but as a world. Thank you for taking the time to prioritize this day and concentrating on keeping your employees and fellow coworkers in the material handling industry safe. Your attendance and attention to today's events illustrates your commitment to material handling safety and keeping everyone safe by helping prevent forklift accidents and injuries. We, as part of the material handling industry, have always believed that forklifts were important to our nations and our economies. But not until this recent COVID-19 pandemic did we truly understand that forklifts are vital to our nation and world's supply chain. They enable the transportation and restocking of virtually every retail outlet to include grocery stores, pharmacies, convenience stores, big box stores, and hardware stores, just to name a few. Forklifts play a very important role in practically every production, warehouse, and distribution facility that is used to manufacture and transport products to our marketplaces. Forklifts, both new and old, are an essential and critical infrastructure that ensures that the public can get food, medical supplies, personal hygiene items, and other necessities whose volume can, of demand can only be met by moving the material with a forklift. Forklifts are essential to enabling the nation and the world's economies to continue to meet the demand for products and services that the public relies on in their day-to-day -day lives. The day after our governor announced the shutdown of our state, except for critical and essential businesses, we shared a photo with our employees of a Kentucky National Guard soldier using a Clark forklift to transport critical medical supplies. This helped our employees realize the important role our product plays in today's crisis. As the name implies, National Forklift Safety Day is a national event taking place at forklift manufacturers and dealer locations all over the United States. These events across the country provide owners, operators, pedestrians, and anyone even casually involved with forklift operation the opportunity to learn valuable safety skills designed to reduce accidents through the safe operation and maintenance of forklifts. The National Forklift Safety Day program promotes the idea that safety is a shared goal. We are very proud that our ITA member companies and dealers support this. Since the inception of National Forklift Safety Day at Clark, we have set aside the day to promote safety for both our employees and our local businesses. We start with an early morning local TV interview focused on the importance of forklift safety. We invite area businesses to share a barbecue lunch with our employees, including a local radio station which broadcasts live from our events. Our visitors have a chance for an always popular factory tour. We also have two forklift driving events. One is a skills competition for experienced drivers that generally includes operators from our factory and some of our engineers. I won't comment on which group the winner usually comes from. We have a second driving course set up for office personnel to give them an opportunity to drive a forklift. They are as much a part of our industry as we are, and it helps for them to learn about and appreciate our product. No doubt the most important thing we do every year for National Safety Day is to offer a local businesses a three-day complimentary train the trainer workshop for anyone involved in forklift safety training in their own business. Our company trainer is a former 82nd Airborne Division trainer, and he brings back memories of some of the finest animated military instructors I've ever witnessed. Needless to say, Dave drives home the importance of safety in a completely unforgettable manner, and this course fills up every year. Using Google searches, you can find widely varying statistics on the number of forklift accidents each year. 
The Industrial Truck Association has done considerable research, called through the government data and examined underlying assumptions and has developed what we consider the most accurate portrayal of annual accidents going back to 1992. I will share with you these trends that we are seeing so you can see for yourself how things have changed since OSHA implemented training requirements in 1999. But before going into the numbers, I would ask you to keep in mind that it isn't really numbers that we're talking about, but what they represent. Each incident represents people, coworkers, friends, and employees whose lives are disrupted or worse by a preventable forklift incident. That is what makes today important. The data on the next several slides provide accident trend lines for both forklift riders and pallet trucks and examine these from different perspectives. The first slide shows non-fatal riders accidents since 1992 as shown by the blue line. This chart has two Y axes to allow you to see data trends that are on completely different orders of magnitude. The number of accidents is based on the left-hand Y axis. The source of the accident data is the Bureau of Labor and Statistics as researched by ITA. In 1999, OSHA implemented requirements for businesses that operate forklifts to provide specific training, which I'll describe later. You can see from the chart the steep reduction in accidents after the 1999 uh, implementation of training until 2011, at which point the slope has flattened, but with a slight upward trend. I think part of this upward trend can be attributed to a significant increase in the forklifts being operated during this time frame. The other two trend lines are keyed from the right-hand y-axis, with the orange line showing the new shipments entering the market each year with 162,000 riders being shipped into the market in the time frame from 2011 to 2018. New factory shipments are based on data provided by the ITA. Since accidents are spread across all units in the field and not just new shipments, a better correlation would be the comparison to the entire population in operation. While we don't have precise data on field population, an approximation can be made if you assume an average useful life of a forklift. For comparison purposes, the green line shows the field population based on a 10-year average life, which is close to 1.2 million units in operation in the United States at the end of 2018. While this assumption we find the number of forklifts operating in the field increased by 120,000 units, or 11% from 2011 to 2018. The next slide provides the corresponding data for powered pallet trucks. Again, the number of accidents is shown in the blue and is keyed by the left-hand y-axis. From this slide, it does not appear that OSHA training has been as effective as, as it has been for riders but assuming an eight-year average life for a powered pallet truck, as shown by the green line, the number of pallet trucks operating in the field increased by 62,000 units, or 24.5% from the period from 2010 to 2017. The following slide combines the rider and pallet truck accident data to give a complete picture of non-fatal forklift accidents and see what the overall trend has been since the institution of OSHA mandated training. Here the blue line shows the total number of accidents which peaked at over 20,000 accidents in 1994 and has hovered around 10,000 accidents since 2012. To complete the picture of accident trends, the next slide shows the fatal accidents over the 21-year period. While several orders of magnitude lower in number than the previous charts, it is obviously a concern for all involved with safety. I've added a four-year moving average trend line, which is a useful tool to get in a sense of the trend. The chart shows a downward trend, but an unfortunate uptick in 2018. The last year industry data is available. I joined this industry in 1995, so I was around for much of this history. Our engineers are often called upon to review accounts of reported accidents. So while not based on hard data, I can tell you from my own involvement, I too have seen a very significant reduction in reported cases. Employers must understand that a good material handling safety program involves more than just a one-time forklift operator training course 
as outlined in OSHA 1910.178, which governs powered industrial trucks. It also involves pedestrian supervisory training, as well as refresher training and evaluation. The conditions that require refresher training are outlined in this slide, with a maximum interval of three years between training sessions. Keep in mind, training requirements are not just for the forklift operator, but it should be for everyone that works around a forklift. That keeps material handling safety in the forefront of everyone's mind, and that is what today is all about. According to OSHA, the Powered Industrial Truck Standard was the seventh most frequently cited OSHA standard in fiscal year 2019, with 2,592 citations. Four of the five most frequently cited sections within this standard concerned operator training. While the improvement in accident reduction is the goal, this statistic on OSHA citations is an additional point to bring up to business decision makers when talking about the need to invest in forklift operator training. Forklift incidents can be prevented with proper training and continuous education about the material handling environment safety. That's why it's so important to ensure that every worker receives the training and tools they need to recognize and address hazards and how to work around and operate forklifts safely. A good forklift training program involves more than a forklift, its operators, and the environment it operates in. It involves all the personnel who work around or near the forklift and especially includes supervisors. Anytime you have employees working in close proximity to forklifts or other heavy equipment, the potential for serious accidents becomes very real, especially when they have not been properly trained and are not abiding by mandatory safety rules and procedures. Both pedestrians and forklift operators need to know the safety rules and procedures, and they must follow them in order to keep the flow of products moving without endangering others in the process. Supervisors must also know the importance of safety rules and procedures to be empowered to enforce them to ensure all employees are safe while working in their particular areas of responsibility. While many of you may be very knowledgeable about our industry, I'd like to take a few minutes to share information from a recent OSHA report. While most of these points are well known to industry veterans, we need to keep in mind the high level of turnover with forklift operators, first-line supervisors, and even safety officers and plant managers. Constant reminders of these basics will go a long way to keep people safe. OSHA provides a breakdown of the most common causes of forklift accidents, which I'll briefly review. I'll also show a sample slide for each of these seven points that I've taken from Dave's 291-page Train the Trainer course. The first most common cause of forklift accidents is poorly trained operators. He or she may not know how to respond to a changing workplace. New inventory, obstacles, and employees or changes in floor grading can all cause problems for an inexperienced operator. That is why it is important for the driver certification training take place in the actual work environment rather than in a parking lot using cones and the supervisor understand his or her responsibility to update operators anytime the working environment changes. Speeding. Unfortunately, sometimes once drivers become comfortable, they may drive irresponsibly. In some cases, workers are under pressure to finish the job quickly or meet a timeline. If a vehicle stops quickly, the load may topple due to harsh braking. We are certainly seeing a significant increase in forklifts being ordered with speed limit controls. OSHA advises drivers stay at or below five miles an hour. Historically, we would see requests for a speed limit set in the seven to eight mile an hour range, but it's become much more prevalent to see requests for five miles an hour. So it seems companies out there are paying attention. At Clark, we have engineers working in several countries, and part of my role is the coordination of these efforts. We have bi-weekly teleconferences that provide updates on projects as well as trends in each region around the globe. One trend I'd like to share with you is from one of our engineers in Australia. Craig formerly chaired the engineering committee of the Australian organization similar to ITA. He tells me in Australia that while not a formal statutory requirement, the statutory bodies in their guidance papers make it clear they expect speed limiting. 
So in effect, it has become a requirement that the end users have to buy buy for their risk management and for all forklifts in Australia are ordered with speed limiting. Something to think about. Other items at OSHA sites include operating a forklift with elevated load. OSHA regulations encourage drivers to carry loads as near to the ground as possible, approximately four inches from the floor, a point that should be emphasized during operator training. In proper turning, forklifts are designed to balance heavy loads. Without a load, they are not the sturdiest machines. Drivers need to be trained to slow down well before the turn and maintain a gradual speed through the turn. Insufficient warnings and markings. This is a point that the safety officer and plant or facility manager must closely consider. It is not just the forklift and the operator, but the pedestrians working in the same area must be considered. I recall several years ago visiting one of the major auto manufacturers. Their material handling engineer shared with me that they had done a study and their largest safety related expense involved forklifts and pedestrians. As we were walking through the facility, he looked at me and added, these mostly involved the visitors. I did get the feeling that he used that line on most of his guests. In workplaces with both foot and forklift traffic, it is an absolute necessity to mark forklift zones. If people walk through these zones on a regular basis, there are several steps you can take to make the environment safer. Tape to mark the approved pedestrian area is the easiest. If wears or tears occur, it is easier to replace them than having to replaint lines. Giving rides or riding on forklift load. I must say in my 25 years in the business, I have never witnessed this happening, but it made it the OSHA list, so it must happen somewhere. And Dave includes it in his course. So this is another item to be stressed in training and certainly reinforced with first line supervisors. Workplace design. This final point made by OSHA is one where the sales professionals in our industry can help. Having the right forklift for the right application can make a major impact on safe forklift operation. Particular attention needs to be paid when forklifts are needed to operate in close quarters. As I said, all common knowledge to us veterans, but I am reminded of a favorite TV show from years ago that some of you may be old enough to remember. It was called Hill Street Blues. It was a police series and pretty much every episode would include a scene where the precinct sergeant would conduct roll call and give start of work instructions. He would dismiss the squad, but as they were pushing their chairs back to get up and head to the door, he would loudly say, hey, hey. And once again, he regained their attention and he would always remind them, one more thing, don't forget, be careful out there. Think about the new operator and the first line supervisor. While these points may be common knowledge to many, there is no downside to constant positive reinforcement. I've highlighted some of the contributing factors to accidents that come to the top of the OSHA studies. So when asked to speak at today's meeting, I decided to bring these points up as I feel they are most impactful to the numbers I've previously shown you on the statistics slides. And remember, those are not sterile numbers on a chart, but a graphical representation of people whose lives have unfortunately been impacted by improperly operated forklifts. So I felt the best use of the brief time we have today would be to highlight these fundamental items, not because I think that many of you may be unaware of them, but rather I want to take this opportunity to ask that you think about the new and inexperienced operators and first line supervisors in forklift operations around the country and think about how training and constant reminders can make an important difference to how their day turns out. But one very important point I want to make. The items I've discussed are not intended to be the be all and end all of forklift safety. Rather, I go back to Dave's three-day training course with 291 PowerPoint slides. He hits these basic items hard, very hard, in a way I'll say that his students will never forget. But he also covers a wide range of other important safety-related topics, from the importance of daily operator pre-use inspections, the all-important stability triangle, how to safely handle batteries, understanding data plates and decals, upright safety, dock operations, 
tires and traveling surfaces, etc., etc. These and many other points need to be covered in a comprehensive training program. I would like to recognize the Industrial Truck Association because that organization was instrumental in bringing this event into reality. The ITA and its member companies continue to work with the OSHA and other government agencies to increase and stress the importance of forklift safety. ITA and OSHA formally created an alliance in 2004 to work together to provide members and others in general industry information and resources to protect the safety and health of workers. Goals including raising awareness of OSHA's rulemaking and enforcement initiatives, outreach and communication, as well as training and education. As part of this alliance, the ITA works with OSHA to better educate OSHA's field officers in forklift safety. ITA has been instrumental in educating OSHA's inspector on forklift safety and all member forklift manufacturers participate in these training sessions held across the United States and its territories. To date, almost 900 OSHA, state, and consultation staff have benefited from this training opportunity. This goes a long way in ensuring that OSHA's inspection and compliance assistant personnel know the most up-to-date technical information. Before concluding, I would like to thank those before me that conceived the idea of National Forklift Safety Day and those that have kept it going each year since then. I particularly would like to thank the members of the ITA staff whose effort make this day possible. Finally, I would like to thank the fellow members of the engineering subcommittee who work across company lines to craft, support, and adopt engineering safety codes and standards intended to promote public health and safety for all. I hope I've given you some food for thought during these last few minutes, and I hope you will enjoy listening to and watching the other events that will be taking place today. Please stay safe and healthy. Again, thank you for taking the time to watch and listen to the events of National Forklift Safety Day.